recording. All right. So uh, this malware analysis course from this college, I think in Connecticut, is now open source and free. So you might want to check it out. There's a lot of interesting lectures here, like I'd probably like to see this one in Ghidra and maybe some of these others building malware and such to see how it goes. Um, I was less impressed by the research projects, just looking at the titles. They look pretty rudimentary, but anyway, check them out. There may be good stuff here. Somebody's on malware analysis course from the University of Connecticut. They published it all openly so you can see it. So it'd be fun to take a look at lectures and such. What's that? I think Connecticut, but I'm not sure. Anyway, um, that's, that might be fun. And uh, this, there's, a, there's something called the Earn It Act. Now, this is from Lindsey Graham and a Democrat, a bipartisan law to limit encryption in America, which is something, of course, the government has always wanted to do, uh, the way they already did on the phone network. And the point of this one is the Section 230. Section 230 is the law that protects uh, internet companies, thank you, from liability for anything their users put on their website. So Facebook greatly relies on it and Twitter and all the others. And uh, some lawyers want to repeal it, but these people have decided that you should earn your Section 230 protection. And so you will only be protected from liability by what users post if you agree to do measures to prevent child sexual exploitation. But the people say that their measures they require would prevent you from using end-to-end -end encryption. I found very little technical detail here, so I'm not sure quite what to make of this. But um, they said there'd be no way you could actually do what it requires without not having end-to-end -end encryption. So I don't uh, know enough to have an informed opinion about this. But uh, Matthew Green is saying it's terrible, and other cryptographers are. But they're all, as far as I can tell, the current cryptography establishment believes that the law, the government has no right to ever see anything, and that, and I think their position is unreasonable. Anyway, but so uh, they're having the fourth annual Hack the Pentagon contest with ethical hackers pan, uh, attacking it and getting um, bug bounties. I did the first one. I didn't find anything good but other people did and they paid off an awful lot of money to people. So that's good, clean fun. And the thing I like about it, of course, is it motivates other people to accept vulnerability reports. Speaking of which, Caitlin hacked me pretty badly yesterday or the day before, stuck up to my machine and got all my passwords and started getting at everything. So I've actually uh, changed some passwords, which has of course lost all my keychain in the Mac. If anybody knows how to change a password on a Mac, I'd like to know. I've had Macs for years and every time you change your password, you lose your keychain. And we spent like hours trying to fix it over there. As far as I can tell, there's no fix. It's one of the bizarre things about Apple. Mac is what, 20 years old, and they haven't learned how to do password change yet without losing everything. Anyway, um, the, anyway, so that's, uh, I did get a solution to lock the machine when I walk away from it though, so that might help. <laughs> I, I should have done that years ago. That is my biggest vulnerability. People can walk up in the classroom. And so I, uh, I got a Bluetooth thing that actually does lock it when I walk away. So that might help, and then again, it might not. What's that? That's it, that's it. I found one of them. No, no, the Bluetooth is like 40 feet away. Well, that, it's further than I would like. It, it, but I found, I tried it at home, and when I walked like uh, to the other side of the garage, like a room and a half, it went off. No, I tried like a Bluetooth speaker. Yeah. I know, so, but I think it's smarter than that. I don't think it, requires the signal to fall to zero. It's somehow measuring the amount. But I couldn't find a sensitivity adjustment. I wanted to adjust it to be more sensitive, but the default is not bad. If you leave the room, it turns off. That's not terrible. Anyway, so... Um, uh, it could be all that. That's right. I, I'll know as I test it. I'll find out. Anyway, um, so Amazon is telling all the Seattle area people to work from home. And uh, the, this is the Union of Concerned Scientists, a pretty respectable, serious group, and they're very upset about the way Trump is restricting the EPA. Um, they've already been restricting the weather and environmental studies to tell them to stop saying the earth is warming up and just lie about that. And they're now telling the EPA to, you know, not say that um, pollution is bad or anything. They always, this, this is the way Republicans have always done this. Not, uh, Trump is uh, no more different than most Republican administrations. They always tell the scientific agencies to shut up if they have a politically unpopular message. Yeah. Who? Oh, no, like this, they've always had. Reagan did this. They've all done this. Um, oh, 
are not, not perhaps not quite as quite. As, well, I think I think they were not as blatant. The thing about Trump is he is obvious about it. Um, I know, but the, but so the other ones, yeah, the other ones did it covertly. Oh yeah, studies have come out. I've had, they mentioned them here. I think uh, uh, things like um, tobacco causing lung cancer was suppressed, and there was something else suppressed too. They, governments have always pressured science that's politically undesirable and found ways to hold it back. But um, Trump just sort of openly does it. Anyway, um, I don't think much of it. Neither does the Union of Concerned Scientists, but it's not entirely new. Nixon started the EPA. He was a Republican. Yeah, that's right. There have been Republicans that were in favor of some of these causes. But anyway, um, the Toxic sludge is good for you. Well, there you go. Good. Some people have some tips. Anyway, um, it certainly is more blatant under Trump, how he's just trying to take them, shut up about coronavirus, shut up about pollution, or shut up about global warming and things like that. Um, this is a very interesting show. This is a podcast. And this I thought was very interesting, talking about what will happen if Sanders or Biden got in. And uh, it's very interesting because I suppose I'd be happier with Sanders because Sanders, Biden believes even more than Hillary in the America being the policeman of the world and marching into every other nation with our army and trying to take over and control their disputes and spread our high-minded values. So you'd be a lot more military intervention everywhere um, and the, in the uh, idea that we're superior and we're going to spread our superior values, whereas um, uh, Sanders has been a leftist and his feeling is mostly what we've done is mess up other countries and prop up dictators and suppress their natural desire to elect socialist to communist governments, and we should just leave them alone. We make it worse. And I think the evidence is largely on Sanders' side. So it's interesting. Sanders' domestic policies are insane, and I don't support them, but none of them would possibly get through. His foreign policies are what presidents actually do. And Nixon said this. Nixon said, the only purpose of a president is foreign policy. Domestic policy is controlled by the corporations. That's all I'm here for is foreign policy. And I think, just like Trump, that was when he said something that was true. You're not supposed to say it, but it's true. Anyway, um, we'll see what happens. But it's looking for a moment like Biden's more likely to be the one that gets in, more likely than Sanders. Um, but we'll see. She did. They all dropped out. So it's just these two or Trump. And, uh, you know, Trump seems to fear Biden a lot. Anyway, you can go to the moon. You can be an astronaut. They're taking applications. So check that out if you like. And... Uh, this is awesome. I just want to point out this one. This defense contractor was taken offline by ransomware, and I was just preparing a Windows administration course today and having long arguments with people about this. Ever since the Windows 2000 server class that I used to teach, I got certified in Windows 2000 server. I don't think I'm going to get a job for that anymore. But anyway, even back then, they said you'd never log in as the domain controller on a workstation. You should never, ever do that as a domain administrator. You have a lower privilege account to use there, and you only use the domain administrator account on the domain controller. And this guy, these, this defense contractor got wiped out because the domain administrator was logged in with the domain administrator account, running a browser, clicking on links. And Microsoft has told us for 20 years, no, 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 don't do that. And so, of course, when he got infected, he had the privileges to wipe out everything, which is what happened. Anyway, um, all right. So let's... Uh, uh, get to the official stuff, which is here. So we're going to talk about access controls. And oh, by the way, I believe the schedule has changed. I think I had a plan for a guest speaker, which did not happen. So uh, some dates have changed. So if, if you aren't sure when things are due, take a look. I did readjust some dates to move the TBA that was around here uh, about a month later. So check the dates um, for quizzes and such. Uh, they have changed. Anyway, so access controls. Um, so you have, let me see if I can convince this thing to get lost. All right. Uh, all right, so the point here is you want to know, you want to limit who's allowed to do what. For example, you want to have an administrator user who's allowed to do certain things on your website. You want to have other users that are only allowed to do other things. So this means you have to know who people are and you have to keep track of who they are in a session of some kind. And then you have to have some kind of access control. You have to have some kind of list. This user can access this folder, but other users cannot access this folder. And this may sound obvious, but many websites do not bother to arrange these protections because they're usually not easily automatically provided for you. So there's your vulnerability, vertical, horizontal, and context dependent. Uh, motions are sometimes allowed, which violate the security policy. Um, these, and so vertical privilege escalation is the simplest one people think of where you escalate from user to administrator. You go to a higher privilege account, 
Horizontal privilege escalation is where one user gets into another user's account. So you don't gain more privileges, but you get privileges to something you shouldn't be seeing or modifying. And then there's business logic exploitation, which is sort of the general catch-all, where you do something you shouldn't be able to do, like proceed from ordering to having it shipped to you without going through the purchasing page. That's not exactly moving beyond your privilege level, but it is violating the logic of the app to do what should not be possible. So um, the, one of the most common reasons this happens is security through obscurity. People put something up there that's important, like an administration page, and they do not actually have any access control list on it. They just put it and think you won't find it. And then they make some page where you have to log in to see the link that takes you there. So if you um, can guess the URL of it, you can find it. And our guest, uh, coming, I think coming this weekend, is the high school student that used this to find uh, unreleased poll results before they were officially represented. I think the Washington Post and New York Times were putting up poll results with predictable URLs, and he was able to see them before he was supposed to see them because they were doing this. They weren't really restricting them. They were just putting them up there and hoping nobody would find them. Um, so you can then you just have to guess the URL. So if you look in client-side code, you might find information about it. Like if it's is admin, then, it, then show this item in the menu. Otherwise, don't. So looking at the source code may have clues of where it is. Um, you may be able to figure it out. You have like a document ID here. And so perhaps um, if you can guess the ID, you can see it. Here was an example of someone that sells books or something and they have them online. They're all totally unprotected. You just have to log in or pay to get the URL. So if you just build a script that will try all the possible numbers or something, you can find them. Uh, this sort of thing happens many, many times because developers just don't bother to have proper access control system. Um, all right, uh, they might not be unpredictable random numbers, or they might be visible somewhere in logs or elsewhere. And I mentioned before, if you have multi-stage steps here, select new user, select department, select role, enter username and password, um, it might enforce access control at one step, but not test it again at a later step, so you can skip steps and get more privilege than you should have. Um, there's the one you mentioned before where you pay for these books, but they're just static resources. So if you find the URL, you can get there. So somebody could just post the URL on a forum and everybody can get free copies of the book. And this sort of stuff happens all the time. Uh, all right, then you can have um, restrictions that only go to certain paths. This is very common on Apache servers. Apache servers like to have security rules that have a string or a pattern like a uh, regular expression which has to match something and then it applies and that's risky because there will be ways to alter it which make it no longer match the regular expression but still get you to it uh, another thing they often do is try to restrict things by http request method and that's very dangerous because there are more http request methods than a lot of people realize and a lot of servers will accept invalid request methods and just treat them as a get. And they will have the effect of fetching content from the server, but they will not match the pattern in the rules so the privileges will not apply to them. So they call this verb tampering is another term for it. You have this post or get or head or options here, and um, you can implement this. Also, a strange thing is if you use the head request, you can have a URL including query parameters, and you will not get any results except the uh, top part before the actual content, but that doesn't mean it wasn't processed at the other end because many web servers, in fact, implement get head by performing a get and then just not showing you all the output. So the actual function takes place. And this is something to be aware of when hacking web servers. When you just get a 500 error or a timeout, when you're sending attack code to a web server, that often means success because it did something unusual which did not produce any output that came back to you. That doesn't mean you crashed the server necessarily or failed. It often means you succeeded, but you often will see nothing as a result of success. All right, and so here's actually, if you do have some access control, they often use something foolish like parameters, refer, or location which might be okay as a second factor for two factor, but they're not enough all by themselves. So you can have a parameter someplace like admin equals true, and all you have to do is add that parameter and you're the administrator. This is of course a really terrible idea. Unless you were, for example, to put that in an ASP view state that was encoded or something so that the user cannot easily add it. Uh, you can use the referrer to see where you came from and that, uh, of course, as we know is quite vulnerable because you can fake the referrer to be anything you want. 
You could use the location. This is very common for sports events and other things. They're only shown in one country, not in your country. And so all you have to do is trick geolocation. And there's a ton of ways to do this. The simplest one is use a web proxy or VPN in that country, and then your traffic will appear to come from there. There are other ways to do it. Um, so uh, if you want to see if you have these flaws, then you get a couple of user accounts, and then you compare the response. So here, uh, I have two users, and one of them is the administrator. The top one, colored in blue, shows that this person is the administrator, and the second one is an ordinary user on the right. So Burp has the ability to show you two requests here in the map, the exact request, the exact page that was fetched, and the code there, and it will highlight the differences. So the top user is administrator, the bottom user is not administrator, and if I try to go to this page, it correctly recognizes that one's the administrator and the other isn't. And here's a admin page, which this person has the option to do things like list user sections and add new user on the right, and this one gets a not authorized message because this page notices whether you're the administrator or not, but there's another page on the website which does not notice. So here, if you click the get list username option on the previous page, it will show you the usernames, and instead of actually maintaining the access control, it just redirects you to a PHP script that dumps the usernames, in this case an ASP or ASHX script, and that script can be accessed directly by a low privilege user. So you can't get to the menu of items, but you can get to the function without administrative privileges, and that's insecure direct object reference which is extremely common. The simplest kind of, of insecure direct access reference is the one that got me in trouble at the University of Louisiana. People just put confidential files on a server with no protection at all. And this is, I think, now the number one vulnerability, like open Amazon buckets. They just have a million records in a database that's open to the world, and they, it's just sitting there for anybody to take, no password or anything. You, uh, the, it's an accident, I suppose, but if there's any security, they would say, well, nobody would find it. But in these days, there are so many crawlers and scanners and, and Google bot and everything scouring the whole internet that if you put anything exposed to the internet and think nobody's going to find it, that is probably not true. A lot of people will probably find it and it won't take very long either. So you can test direct access to methods. Um, and this one here, you can see if the access is limited. Here's a request. Uh, you can often guess other methods. See this reply from this one shows that this is an IBM server. And therefore, if you know the brand of server, you can read the documentation or install it and play with it and find out what, um, what other methods are likely to be available on that server. So once you've got the names of a few likely functions, you can then um, look at the URLs of high privilege resources and log into low privilege user and try to get back to them. This is uh, one of the reasons why a proper API or web pen test, you really ought to have some accounts to play with from your customer. Real administrator accounts, real non-administrator accounts would be the best way or source code. All right, so uh, you can log in as administrator, find requests, try other methods besides uh, get or post head options, just random verbs that are spelled wrong and see if they have a result. They might very well. Um, so to secure these, don't assume the user will not find things that are just hidden. Don't trust anything that came from the user. Don't assume they'll go through your pages in the expected order or that they won't tamper with the data. Uh, this last one, I think, is the most common flaw. It is very, most coders and website designers don't likely understand that users don't have to use a browser, that they can use something like Burp or Postman to craft a malicious request. They, they think that anything you can't do by clicking something in the browser will not happen, because of course that is true 99% of the time, but uh, you're worried about the hackers that are bypassing that. So, you know, best practices, you should have some kind of access control mechanism. You should write it generally. There should be one generic access control script, like in Windows servers, you have a Windows domain controller. There has to be a single point of authentication and a single point of security barrier. And then you have to make sure that every part of your application goes back to use the central component. Otherwise, of course, as your website sprawls, somebody will add another function and it won't have access control. If you expect everybody to paste a copy of some access control script everywhere, you really have to think the same way Microsoft did. If you want to control the security of Windows servers, you have to have one special server, and every action has to go to that server for approval first. And that server knows who everybody is, knows everybody's passwords, knows all the permissions for all the files and folders and printers and everything, and therefore you have one place where you control security. You have to design your website the same way if you want to be secure over any length of time. 
So uh, you can also to use two-factor authentication, where not only do they have to log in, but they have to have the right IP address or the right physical location or something like that. It's a good idea too. Um, and don't trust anything that came from the client, unless perhaps you have a signed or encrypted field that you really have confidence they won't be able to change. Um, and consider uh, forcing another layer of authentication before they do something really nasty. And you should log events, of course, and uh, do something about the attacks, like ban that user or something. So that's the point. Central access control here is exactly the same reason you have central access control in Windows domains or many other systems. You can only maintain a system over time and uh, survive the constant development and increase of your network and adding of new things if you just have one central point of security control. Um, that's the way to do it. Here's an example of what you might have, which is very much like what you'd have in a group policy on a Windows server. You have many kinds of users, administrator, company administrator, normal user, auditor, site supervisor, and various roles of them, and just a whole matrix of things. This user can do these things, that user can do those things. This is something to be very familiar to anybody that sets up privileges in an Active Directory domain, and that's the kind of complexity that you need to match a real business situation. But you can only have that if you have a single point of control for it all. All right, and so uh, I just mentioned before, there's some fun PHP examples here. This one is weak typing, which I think I mentioned before. Um, this PHP uses this kind of comparison with two equal signs, where you take the MD5 of the password, and then you see if it equals this string. And if you have a string that is all numbers, except for a zero E at the start, PHP can interpret that as the number zero. It is zero times 10 to the 199 trillion or something which is technically zero. And because you use two equal signs, this weakly typed language changes the MD5 on the left to a number and compares it to a number on the right. So if it is another password that hashes to a similarly structured value, it will match. Now, however, there are very few passwords that actually match to that. If it has any letters, they will not be interpreted as a number. So this is more a theoretical thing, but it is a problem with weak typing, which is, you know, why I sort of got fed up with JavaScript and PHP and Python and started learning Go instead, a strongly typed language like C and Go would not fall for this. You would not be guessing whether this is a string or an integer. It would, you would tell it, this is a string, it's always a string, this is an integer, it's always an integer. It wouldn't guess what you mean. And you can force that in PHP by using triple equal signs, but developers may not know that. Anyway, I've got some cahoots about this stuff. So this is chapter eight. So that is this one, 129S, chapter eight. There we go. And uh, I don't know what this garbage is, host live, I guess. They have been adding features. As usual, I wish they would just knock it off, but you know. I think the whole world is this way. Everybody should bring out new features about one-tenth of the rate they do for most of us, anyway. Um, We've got a lot of uh, customers today. They're all online, which is something you get used to. If they close the college, you'll have to do all our classes this way for a while. All right. So I got 16. Very nice. Yeah. I think that's about all there can possibly be. Oh, now they are dropping off and coming back. If it gets up to 16 again, I'll go. Four or five seconds, whichever comes first. All right. I guess it's 15. So, all 
All right, which one do you bypass with proxy servers? Obscure your location. That's the main thing it does. All right. And there we go. Smiley face is winning. All right. So what kind of attack is reading somebody else's Gmail? It, a horizontal escalation. All right. All right. And what kind of attack is it if you access pages out of order? Okay. Exploiting the logic. Aha, a new champion emerges. And which one relies on security through obscurity? That's unprotected functionality. This is just hiding something where there's no actual barrier to using it. You're just hoping they won't find it. So, Peter Chi is the one of the winners. All right. And Gary Lynn. Oh, okay. And I got real names for all of them. That's not that common. All right, good. So, all right, so I want to do the first bit of the next chapter, which uh, used to confuse people a lot. It may not confuse you so much this time because we've already talked about SQL injection, but I find a lot of my students are unfamiliar with databases and they get confused by this. So decided to break this chapter in half. So to attack data stores, um, they're mostly SQL, XML, and LDAP. There are a few exotic things like, Nook, like Cassandra and there's Mongo and stuff but these are the most common ones. And they're of course high value targets. Databases are full of large amounts of records and usually have social security numbers, credit card numbers, addresses, sometimes passwords. So this was the number one vulnerability. It has been, as far as I know, ever since the beginning of the OWASP top 10, number one has always been injection. Um, it is absurdly easy to exploit and absurdly dangerous. Um, all right. so. And this number that is more than 90% of all stolen data is from maybe three or four years ago. Like I say, I suspect that Amazon buckets have now exceeded it, but I haven't seen anybody actually add up all the records and decide. But in general, data breaches just get bigger and bigger and bigger every year. So whatever the recent problem is probably outnumbers all the prior ones. <coughs> anyway, so anytime you have an interpreted language where code is not compiled like C, but it's executed line by line, then you're likely to have um, command injection if you take any data from the user to make that line of code. So SQL, LDAP, Perl, and PHP are languages that work this way. And so you saw this in the King Injection Challenge. You can put in an IP address and it's just executed on the server as a line of bash ping followed by this address and you can just add a semicolon and other bash commands and execute them on the server. And that's because it's an interpreted system where the commands you take in are processed one by one. They're not pre-compiled and stored like a compiled C program to where no data that comes in from the user can change that code, at least not so easily. So in compiled languages, you can still do code injection, and we're doing it in 127, but you have to inject code in raw binary form as uh, real machine code, which you can view as assembly code and disassembler. So it is the same principle, really, but it is much more difficult because you cannot use a high-level language that people are familiar with. But it can be done, of course, and that's how all the buffer overflows and heap overflows and memory corruption attacks work. So if you want to bypass a login, 
in a SQL screen, you typically have a query like this, select data from a table where username equals the user's username and password equals their password. And this will only return any results if they have the right username and the right password. That's what a typical login screen looks like. But if you put in a carefully crafted username like admin apostrophe dash dash, then it will be username equals administrator and the dash dash will begin a comment. So all the rest of the line will be ignored. So it will not check your password and it will just let you log in as the administrator if this works. Um, if you don't know the administrator, username even, you can just put in this string as both username and password and then the username condition becomes username equals nothing or one equals one and the password condition um, is, is commented out again. So again, you can get in as the first user in the database, which is typically the administrator because the controlled database structures are created when you first install the system. And at that time, the administrator is the only user. So we, we did this before. You can go to any, we, if in your homework, you're doing this. Um, the union operator lets you add a whole second select statement after the first. So even if you're only injecting a parameter like a username, you can, in, you can create your own custom select query. The only problem is it's not an independent select query. It's additional data to be added to the result of the first select query. And there are some restrictions on that. So a single select query, you look for one person, you get just the username. But if you're using union, then you can just add other things like SSNs below the username. Now, if you have a text field, you can put any kind of data under it. Numbers will go in fine. But you can't violate the number of rows, which is an issue. By the way, another thing I noticed a lot in doing CTFs is that you have tried to kind of different comment characters. Often that dash dash doesn't work. Anyway, the problem with union is that the results you're adding to the results table have to match the structure of the table. If they don't, it will give you an error message. So um, one thing is you have to know the username or what you're asking for, like name, comma, SSN. And if you try to get both the name and the SSN and combine it to the search, it won't add because the search only gives you one column. And looking for name, comma, SSN, you're getting two columns and it will not union a two column table to a one column table. It will tell you the select statements have different number of columns. So um, another thing is if you have a numeric field, you cannot put string data in or you get an error too. So that's an issue. And uh, so here's the steps he recommends. The first thing is find the number of columns. Null is a useful thing because it will fits any data type. So if you don't even know if it's numbers or dates or anything, you can select null. So just select null, 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 and see which of them does not give you an error. And that will tell you how many columns there are. So that's, and automated tools do this. And I've seen a lot of like Russian forums where you show this kind of query going by. Um, so that's the thing. This one, a single null would work, of course. You'll see the real herp derper found and then an empty column showing there are no results from the second query. But the point is, it's not an error. So you know the number of columns is in fact one. And so then you find out which one of them is a string by just changing one of them to an A and moving this around to see which one runs without an error. And the ones that succeed will be string columns. And that's what you want because whatever data you're looking for, you can put it in a string column. Another issue is which columns that are fetched are actually shown on screen. It may select data, which it uses for something, but it doesn't display them to you. And that's less useful because you're hoping to see the results like the passwords or something. So then you might want to know the version of the server. And there's a few uh, different uh, ways to do it. At at version does it sometimes. And on Oracle, it's V dollars version. There's only a few common database software products and you find out what the injection string is to find the version. So on my server, it'll tell you here, it's, it's Ubuntu running. And uh, anyway, by the way, one thing I thought was funny when I was doing a uh, vulnerability reports you know, of colleges years ago, I found this college in San Francisco, the Mons Montserrat College of Art, and they just had the administrator password just sitting there, the administrator password hash. And I found this on a user forum and noticed this query, which looks like it can automatically generate. It's union select group concat username user password, and then four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty 20 from 20, because what some people do instead of that null, 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 is they just use numbers, select one, two, three, four, five, um, and they have some kind of automated tool that went through this and found out how many columns. So the query behind here must have been selecting maybe 10 columns. And then they found one column that was text, and they concatenated username and password here to show it username, colon, password, and that's what you see. The username is MCA updates and colon, and this is the password hash. And that looked like an MD5 hash to me, and I tried to crack it, and I could not crack it. 
So I notified them and they totally ignored me and it just took years before I guess they updated to another website. But technically, you could argue that it's okay that they ignored me because I couldn't crack the hash. And if the hash is not crackable, then it's actually not a big vulnerability to leak it. But you know, I felt like telling them anyway, not that anybody cared, but anyway. So Microsoft's SQL product is here, for example. And so if you search for Matthew, you'll get Matthew's name and email address. So this is the search page that gives you two columns of data and they're both text columns. So the next step would be um, find out how many columns there are. So union select null and see what happens. And null gives you an error. Two nulls give you an error. You have to get up to five nulls before you don't get an error. So this is one of the pages I was talking about. It fetches five fields from the table, but it only shows you two of them. So now you have to find out which ones are actually visible if you want to steal the data. So the next thing is to find out where the strings are. So you can put an A in there and you see where it goes. Now you know the first one is name and you hunt around until you find the second one. Now you can get um, two columns at once. And so since you have two columns of data, you can make this much faster. The technique I showed in the original demonstration here is three steps. First, we get database names, then the table names, and then the column names. But now we can do them two at a time. So we're going to get table name and column name. So the shop items table appears three times, and here's the, the columns, price, pro, quality, ID, and product name. And the users table has username and password. So it's nice. You find the table name and the field names with a single query. So now, with just one more query, you can get the names and the passwords. Just replace that with username, password from the right table, users, and you'll just get username matching to the password. And if you do the uh, extra credit one that I showed you several classes ago, you have to do quite a bit more struggle to match the usernames with the passwords because you only have one column of data. Anyway, that's the uh, joy of SQL injection, which is an uh, important trick that every pen tester should know. So this is 9A, I believe. Let's see if this looks right. Yeah. <laughs> kind of too late to vote for anybody. See a hand, I'm not aware of the significance of this gesture. Can I give it a few more seconds? All right, I guess that's it. All right. Which database is free and open source? Okay, MySQL, that's why it's usually done for CCFs and poverty restriction to college professors and stuff. Uh, but it's not the most common in the real world. So I now have a Windows Server, which I am keeping up with some difficulty as people hack it. I probably ought to put a database on it so we can have some MS SQL SQL injection, but I haven't got that up yet. Aha, it's the person with the strange hand gesture is winning. All right, which method combines two queries together? Okay, union, good. And they're staying up there again. And if this injection succeeds, what have you learned? Null A null. Is 
The second column is a string. You could not add A otherwise. All right. And there we go. And what's the purpose of this injection? Null, null. That's the point, you find out how many columns there are. If that succeeds, there are two columns, and it doesn't matter what type of data they are, null is always something you can add to any column. All right, so. Phil Fry, okay. And Gary Lynn wins again. And Zoe wins, good, all right. All right, so. I've got the scores, and uh, I guess I'm going to stop the recording. I'll leave the share going for a little while in case any questions are coming in.